Well, welcome everybody to the last Transcend seminar of the semester. Um, we've had a really great time, but I think we're going to end with a bang. I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. We wanted to have her come last year, but it didn't work out, so we're really thrilled to have her this year. Um, Dr. Jesse Jones Smith is an obesity epidemiologist who studies social, environmental, and economic causes and correlates of obesity risk. Specifically, her research focuses on investigating distal drivers of nutrition related health inequities and follows three main areas, investigating community and individual economic resources as causal factors and obesity-related health status, evaluating obesity-related impacts of health and non-health-related policies, and documenting disparities in nutrition-related diseases based on socioeconomic factors uh, and race ethnicity across the lifespan. So we're, we're in for a treat, I think, today to hear about some of her uh, natural experiments that she's been working on. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Joan Smith. Thanks for having me. Um, I now feel pressure to go out with a bang. Um, hopefully it'll just be okay. Um, but um, it's really nice to have the opportunity to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's great to have the opportunity to share some of the research that I've been working on um, with you all. So um, I, what I plan to talk about today is a natural experiment um, that I've been working on for the last four or five years through a grant from NIH um, that looks at the role of economic resources and community resources in childhood obesity. Um, and I wanna just start off by acknowledging um, the rest of the team that helped me do this study. So uh, first, Will Dow, who's an economist at Berkeley um, and was my mentor on this project. And then the California Rural Indian Health Board and California Tribal Epicenter. You'll see as we get into the slides that this um, project is focused on Native American health. And I couldn't have done this study without the, um, the collaboration from these two uh, agencies and the people within them, and then graduate students that helped me do a bunch of the work. Um, so, let's see. Um, in order, in terms of like where we're going today, I've structured the talk to um, start by providing motivation, tell you a little bit about why I'm interested in this natural experiment, why I think it's important. Um, then I'll give you an overview of the project study design. Then I'm going to talk through the results of uh, four papers, the four main papers from this project, really briefly. So, um, and then finally, I'm going to end with, um, again, really brief results from the last paper of this project. Um, so I'll spend a lot of time up here. So don't get scared if we're like halfway through and I haven't even started on paper one yet. Um, most of, a lot of the, the background I think is really important to understand this study. Um, and then I'll spend a, a bit of time on the background for the first paper because it leads into the uh, next few papers. Um, so in terms of background and motivation for this study, I am really interested in the role of economic resources um, as potential causes of health inequities because of the market disparities that we see in many chronic conditions in the U.S. and in countries all over the world. Um, so this is just one example, but there's many examples just like this. Um, what I'm showing you here is the percent of uh, U.S. adults living with two or more chronic conditions according to um, poverty status. So what you can see from this slide is that Adults living in poverty, shown in the purple bar, are twice as likely to be living with two or more chronic conditions compared to uh, wealthier counterparts, counterparts shown here in the teal bar. Um, so 33% of those living in poverty um, are living with two or more chronic conditions compared to only 16% of um, those who are at 400% of the poverty line. And if we look at specific chronic conditions, this inverse relationship between economic resources and health outcomes is seen across many different chronic conditions. So here we're looking at coronary heart disease, stroke, emphysema, kidney, kidney disease, and diabetes. And again, these light purple bars are the lowest income group, and then the tealish bars are the higher income group. And you can see this graded relationship between higher prevalence of these chronic conditions and lower income. And this is um, some, these are some results from my own work that looks at specifically at childhood obesity, which is the outcome um, that the rest of my study is gonna talk about today. Um, and so this is work that I did with a master's student. And what we wanted to know was, um, should I stop? No, no, I was just gonna do this. 
Oh, okay. Um, thanks. Um, and also, please feel free to stop me. I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions as we go, um, or we can wait till the end. But if something I'm saying isn't making sense, definitely stop me for clarification. Um, so what, what, what we wanted to know with this study, we had a really large sample of, I think, uh, one and a half million kids from California with BMI data. And we just wanted to know, are kids with lower income at um, higher risk of obesity or do they have higher prevalence of obesity? Um, we've seen this uh, among white populations, but is this true for both boys and girls and among the eight different race ethnic groups that we had represented in our really large sample here? And so what you're looking at are prevalence ratios. So anything above one means that the lower income um, kids had higher prevalence of overweight and obesity, and anything where the error bars don't cross that line is statistically significant. And so what you can see looking across this graph is that for both boys and girls, and for each of these eight different race ethnic groups, we do see that um, kids with lower income have higher prevalence of overweight and obesity. And so, um, you know, this is one example. We see many other examples like this in the literature, a cross-sectional look at the relationship between income and obesity. And there are really, you know, plausible pathways by which economic resources might be causally related to increased risk for weight gain and obesity. And I've listed just six here that I think about a lot. Um, so it's possible that economic resources, I mean, it's likely that economic resources determine the neighborhoods that we live in, and then that can determine the am amenities that we have access to and the safety of our neighborhoods. Uh, economic resources determines our ability to afford healthy food, can determine our ability to have time and money for physical activity. Um, certainly economic resources is uh, related to higher levels of Low economic resources related to higher levels of chronic stressors, um, higher probability of being food insecure, and might be related to um, sleep quality and sleep quantity. Um, and each of these things provides a pathway by which low economic resources might be causally related to um, increased risk for weight gain and eventual obesity. But most of the studies that we have to date are not designed to test whether this is a causal relationship or whether this is just an association. Um, and so I wanna spend a little bit of time on you know, why I think it's important for us to move past just these cross-sectional studies of associations to getting closer to something that we think might be a causal relationship. Um, and one of the reasons is that I think the questions that I've listed here are two really important questions and they're causal questions. Um, so are economic resources structural causes of health and health inequity? I think it's important for us to know that. Um, does something like poverty alleviation, does that improve health? So these are really policy relevant questions that when I believe when a policy window opens, we as sort of public health researchers and me and uh, in the realm of uh, health disparities and social determinants of health, I wanna be backed with some information about what do we really know if you give uh, population resources, can that improve? health. That's a causal question. Um, so I think if we have a better understanding of this moving beyond the cross-sectional studies, we'd be less likely to sort of uh, waste money, political will, um, and time proposing solutions that in the end might not work because they were based on data that actually wasn't designed to <coughs> test um, whether these two things are causally related. The other thing is, that I think is important when in doing this work on social determinants is really interrogating um, potential non-causal explanations for these associations. So we might say, wow, there's so many studies out there that show that income um, and economic resources are related to a whole slew of different chronic diseases. We think income and racism are fundamental causes of diseases. Um, what, what else do we need? Well, I think we really need to interrogate what are the other potential alternative explanations for the relationships that we see across population and across time. And the first one is reverse causation. So um, it's possible, I might think that economic resources cause a propensity for weight gain and obesity, but it's also possible that it could work in the other direction. Um, and to think about this, um, think about uh, weight stigma and weight bias. And we know that weight stigma and weight bias are prevalent in today's society. 
And these things affect the probability of people getting hired, the probability of people getting promoted, and the wages earned. So in this one way, we have pretty good evidence that weight might actually come back and affect our own um, economic resources or the resources of our family. Um, the second potential alternative explanation is unmeasured compounding. And this is, you probably all learned from your methods class, um, you're probably familiar with this condition, or uh, yes, condition. Um, so unmeasured compounding is a situation where um, we think two variables are related, but really a third variable is causing both of those things instead of one causing the other. So what we're usually concerned about in our health studies in terms of unmeasured confounding are things like traits and preferences that we really don't do a good job at measuring in epidemiologic studies. So this could be something like, you know, being, um, having a very high drive, something like that could um, make you do well at school, uh, get a good job, get promoted, end up with high economic resources. And that same drive might cause you to overachieve on health behaviors too. And so it's really like a personal characteristic driving these two things rather than these two things, one of these things driving the other. So this is a, um, an argument that can be put forth uh, to say, well, this could be a non-causal association. Um, and typically in uh, biomedical sciences, what we do to take care of both of these um, threats to causality um, is run randomized control trials. Um, so randomization um, controls for that temporal aspect because we know the disease state of people before they come into our trial, and then we give them a treatment, and then we look at what happens to them afterwards. It controls for unmeasured confounding. This, I think, is the biggest beauty of, uh, of randomized control trials that really studies barely any other study can, design can come close to doing. They balance confounders between the group that gets the treatment and the group that uh, is the control group. So both your measured and your unmeasured confounders are equally distributed in treatment and control, and that's how randomized control trials get over the unmeasured confounding. Um, but in the case of studying economic resources um, and things like income, it's really hard to think about designing a randomized control trial to test whether economic resources are um, are causally related to any kind of health outcome. And this is because it's hard to um, randomize people to receive enough money that we think might promote health and for a long enough time and to watch disease outcomes change as a result. Um, so instead, um, what um, people like me who are really interested in these particular sticky exposures um, do is we look around for natural experiments that might have changed the economic resources of, of uh, a person or a population in what could be argued as a quasi-random um, scenario. So I'm going to pause there and um, see if you all have any questions. Maybe talk a little bit more about natural experiments. Okay. Yeah, I was okay, so let's see. I have um, this slide on natural experiments and then ask me anything that I don't cover. <laughs> um, so in a natural experiment of, say, economic resources, what we're looking for is a situation that happens in the world that changes the economic resources of a population or of a person. And importantly, we want this to happen in a quasi-random way. And what I mean by that is that we don't want this to be the result of somebody, um, like, say, getting promoted and making more money. That, again, would be tied up with those individual traits that we talked about before as unmeasured confounders. Instead, something like winning the lottery among lottery players is more of a random exposure. That person that drawed the right number did nothing to get the money except for play the lottery. So if you compare them to other people that play the lottery, you have a nice quasi-random experiment of what is the impact of the actual money. So that's what we're after with these natural experiments about income. Um, another um, sort of a, a good one that I can think of that isn't, it's more about community and neighborhood resources, um, but how many people have heard of the Moving to Opportunity study? So that was, um, that was more of a social experiment where um, uh, government and researchers paired up and they said, you know, what would be the effect of 
um, taking a group of people who are living in subsidized uh, government housing and uh, allowing uh, and moving them to neighborhoods that are outside of these subsidized like housing uh, units. So basically what we know now of, uh, as of Section 8 vouchers. Um, but the one thing was they required people to move to low poverty neighborhoods. So there it was like, what if you take the same people and move them to a low poverty neighborhood? Then can we look at what is the impact of low poverty neighborhood versus high poverty neighbor neighborhood on economic outcomes and health outcomes? Um, so that's those are the couple. Of, there's other examples too. Like okay, let's say the earned income tax credit. So how many people have heard of the earned income tax credit? I don't know what that is. Um, so it's a tax credit that you get back if you meet a certain income threshold. Um, and the amount of it changes based on your family size and the, uh, the income level that, that you make. So when that policy changed, uh, investigators basically looked at people before and after the policy to see how that money affected their health. Because those people did nothing to change the policy. Instead, they just got the money on a particular year. And so looking at people before and after that year is a good natural experiment to see what is that causal impact of income. Does that make some sense? Yes. So do you, lever do you <laughs> go and randomize two certain things, but you leverage things that are already happening and that makes it random or? Yeah, so you're going, you're trying to make an argument that it's as random as that, that's, that it is a random kind of non-agenic um, thing that happened. Um, uh, yes, so you're, you're looking for a situation where you can make this argument that it's random. Those are few and far between, so a lot of times we pair something that's like almost random with better methods that control for those unmeasured confounding, like at least at baseline. And that's what, that I, what, that's what I ended up doing in this study. So I can tell you a little bit more about that. But that's the idea, looking for things where you can convincingly argue that this randomly happened. Um, there's a good, I can't remember the whole story on this. So this is where my brain fails me. But there was a, a really good kind of random um, assignment of land in Brazil. Um, actually, it was, I think there were um, tenants on a whole bunch of land in Brazil. And basically, randomly, um, you know, 40 to 50% of them became owners. The government just said, like, now you own your plot. And the people right next to them were not in that lottery to become owners. And so that situation created this really, like, arguably random situation where now you can look at how does land holding affect your life chances. So when your participants come in, do you, you kind of look at all these things that, that apply to them, like their own characteristics, and then are you looking for leveraging? Uh, we're usually looking for percent? like, yeah, we're usually looking for like, oh, something happened. Can we match up health data to it? So rather than like having the people in front of you, it's more like, oh my gosh, this, you know, we know that over this set of years, like say in the recession or something like 10 plants closed in uh, Pennsylvania. Let's see if we can match up some health data to see how that like plant closure economic um, thing that happened that wasn't the, the result of anything the workers did impacts their, their health. So it's more like kind of being aware of what's happening in the world and trying to leverage that and connect it with health data. That's what I was gonna ask is how does it affect the study design when you come to kind of the opportunistic about what is occurring instead of kind of having an idea and then moving forward to join variables? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so in a couple slides, I'll tell you like what we decided to do when I, and what I think is best practice is, um, is pairing this like administrative data that you're basically like opportunistically like linking to something that happened. Um, with qualitative data from people who were actually affected so that you have this mixed methods design. It's not perfect, but it's better than just looking at the administrative data and saying like, oh, I have this association, but I don't have any deep knowledge on this. Um, so that's one thing that you can do and is considered kind of best practice. Um, there was something else there, but I can't remember what I was gonna say. Um, 
yeah. Oh, the other thing you do is you find some other things to work on while you wait for natural experiments because <laughs> they are like few and far between. Okay. Um, but lots of times policy, like we just keep an eye on policy and see if like a policy changes something that we're interested in, like something that's not economic resources, but is a policy change um, is something like a soda tax or like the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Like if you can find a good comparison group for that, that might be a good uh, natural experiment for other um, for other types of exposures that you're interested in. Okay, cool. Thanks for all the questions. Makes it much funner. Um, <laughs> please feel free to continue to stop me. Um, so. The natural experiment that I'm using in this research is the advent of Native American owned casinos. Um, and um, I and, and a couple other people, this is not, um, it's hard to find data, to health data to link up with the advent of Native American owned casinos. Um, but I argue that this is a good natural experiment to look at the impact of increased economic resources flowing into Native American communities after they open up or expand a casino. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about casinos because it's not something we typically cover in um, nutrition classes. <laughs> um, so um, Native American owned casinos were um, recognized as legal by the US federal government in 1988 through the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. This established the right for tribes to legally own uh, casinos and profit from them. Um, and in the eyes of the US federal government, they kind of signed off on this and said like, yes, you're good to go um, with the um, explicit purpose of these casinos promoting economic development and poverty alleviation for Native American tribes. Um, the caveat is that tribes still have to come to agreement with their states. And so many states have not come to agreements with tribes and that's why uh, Native American casinos are in some states, but not others. Um, now, because the government, the federal government, um, wanted these casinos to promote economic development and poverty alleviation, which was a shared goal um, with tribes. They mandated that the profits from casinos um, to tribes had to be reinvested in the welfare of the tribe or donated to charitable organizations. And so the way that a lot of tribes have uh, dealt with that um, is by issuing what are called per capita payments to tribal members. So you can think of these as like dividend checks from the casino. So in this way, casinos um, and the dividend check from the casino can directly um, impact the income of tribal members. Usually only members get these payments. Um, it, this depends on the size of the casino and how well it's doing, as well as the number of Native Americans living Native American tribal members. So if you have a really big casino and really few uh, Native American tribal members, then your dividend check will probably be pretty large. Uh, but if you have a large tribe, then it's going to be smaller. And if you have a small casino, then it's going to be even smaller. But if you have a small casino and few tribal members, then you still might be getting a substantial check from the casino. Um, the other way that tribes have dealt with this is by investing in community resources. And many of these uh, resources I discovered in my research are actually potentially related to uh, weight-related health. Um, and here are just some pictures of uh, various things that uh, community members talked about in terms of using the money from uh, the casino in order to build up community resources. So this includes recreation centers, parks, playing fields, in the case of um, really big and profitable casinos, health clinics, sometimes healthy food vendors, and then another big one is safe and stable housing um, for tribal members. Um, so this is something where, um, again, with really profitable casinos, housing is a really high priority and Many times there's waiting lists for tribal members, but everybody gets to be on that waiting list. And as the houses are built, people, the tribal members move into them. Um, so since the passage, passage, I don't know if that's a word, um, of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in 1988, about half of the tribes in the US have decided to open up a casino. And in the year 2000, a couple of economists said like, oh, I wonder if these casinos are really improving the economic outcomes for Native American tribes. So they got some data that they could link to uh, tribal affiliation and they analyzed it and determined that in fact, it did look like tribes with casinos um, had more improvements on these economic factors than tribes that decided not to open casinos. So um, increases in per capita income, increases in employment, and decreases in the population that was working but still poor. 
Um, and so these findings have led, you know, a handful of health researchers to become interested in this, you know, kind of arguably quasi-random um, influx of money to Native American populations. Does this have a positive impact on health? Now, casinos are not all positive. Um, obviously, they're contentious. They're contentious among Native populations as well. Um, so I don't mean to say that this is like a panacea or something that we should think about as the ideal treatment, but you can also think of it as a um, community-owned business that, on average, tends to be successful. Um, and so does you know, this community-owned business that kind of gives back to this communal ownership um, have an impact on um, on health. Might not be a business without in, unintended consequences, but um, yes. Okay, so in order to, uh, so I guess going into the study, my hypothesis was that these casinos would result in increased economic resources, either at the individual level or the community level, and that having more resources would make it easier for families to perform health-related behaviors and would decrease stress. And in that, in those ways, um, those pathways would lead to increase or decrease propensity for weight gain and obesity. So that was my hypothesis going into this. Um, and this is a simplified conceptual model of that. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more about the project study design, which I've already mentioned a little bit about. Um, so first we had to find um, in, like data to link up to the casinos. And I found this unique source of data um, at the California Department of Education. They had been collecting um, kids BMI through physical fitness testing since the year 2000. Um, and so they had this on every fifth, seventh, and ninth grader in public and charter schools. Um, and once I found this data, I limited the rest of my data search to California because California turns out to be a pretty good place to think about this question. There are 106 different tribes. They're spread throughout the state. There's tribes that are rural. There's tribes that are close to urban centers. Some of them have casinos and some of them do not. So after finding the California um, school fitness data, I then realized that I could also use birth records. Um, to look at uh, risk for obesity at a different life stage um, and in a completely different source of administrative data to kind of triangulate any findings. Um, I also just want to mention that in order for this data to be workable, it had to have a large sample of Native Americans. This is really like the rate limiting step. It's very hard to find any data sets with a sizable number of Native Americans rep represented. Um, had to have weight outcomes and it had to have a geographic link so that we could figure out which Native Americans were living near tribal lands with casinos versus near tribal lands without casinos. And then that time dimension. So we wanted to observe at least some of the sample before and after the casino opens up. Um, we paired this with qualitative data collection. As I mentioned, we wanted to get perspectives from tribal leaders and tribal members about how they felt the casino might impact their um, health in general and weight related health specifically. And then from that qualitative data, we decided to develop a um, survey of tribal community resources. Um, we administered that survey to, we sent it to all the, the tribes in the state of California and we got about an 80% response rate. And then the final piece of this is that we're linking these two things. So um, the idea was to see whether tribal community resources mediate any relationship between casinos and BMI that we might find in the administrative data. Okay, so, Okay. Oh, cool. I think we're good. Um, so, questions here? All right. Let me tell you a little bit about the study design for um, the first two papers. This is where we're using the administrative data. Um, our goal here was to compare uh, communities to themselves over time um, and look at how obesity and BMI changes before and after the opening or expansion of a casino. Um, we also needed to have a comparison group, a group of people who were eligible to open a casino but did not do so. And so we use that comparison group to stand in for the trends that we would expect over time had the casino owning group not opened a casino. Um, not sure how well you can see this, but this is, says kind of the same thing in a graphic where, you know, our, in California, in order to open a casino, you have to, um, it has to be on tribal land. So our eligibility was that um, 
people had to be living in a geographic unit that um, included a tribal land. So for the first paper, we used school district because we're, we have our data coming from school records and that's the geography that we had. Um, so we're looking at uh, kids living in school districts, Native American kids living in school districts that contain a tribal land. Um, and uh, oh, we're measuring obesity before and we're measuring obesity every year after. Some of these um, communities open up casinos and we expect that money starts to flow, more money starts to flow into those communities when they do so, and some uh, do not open a casino. Um, now, in terms of that quasi-random, there are uh, very few things that differ um, between tribes that decide to open a casino and tribes that don't. The biggest thing, though, is location. Um, so if your tribal land happens to be by a highway, it's a lot more likely that you will open a casino because it's a lot more likely it will be profitable. Um, but location in this particular context um, is kind of randomly assigned when we think about how um, the land sort of, uh, how Native Americans were forced off homelands and into other lands um, that happened way before anything related to what might make for a good casino or not. Um, so there is a random element. I argue there's a random element in a lot of um, who opens a casino and who does not. But we also take some precautions in our, um, in our analysis and we don't just look at post-casino differences. Um, okay, additionally, instead of just looking at places with a casino versus not, um, we wanted to get some kind of measure of casino dose. And by this, I mean, we're trying to identify places where we think they're gonna have more economic resources coming into that community. Um, we know from our research there that there's like casinos take all shapes and sizes. This is a small casino, has like 100 slot machines. This is a medium sized one that has about 500. And this is a huge casino hotel complex that has 2000 slot machines. Um, it turns out that slot machines are like the big money maker in casinos. Um, they are what the state of California uses to determine how much money each tribe with a casino pays back to the state. Um, so they're kind of a good metric for profitability of these casinos. Um, so what we did is we developed a measure that was uh, total slot machines in a school district um, and divided it by our uh, appro approximation of tribal members, which basically had to come from the census and is the total number of Native Americans living on tribal lands in that district. So we call this slots per capita. Um, it varies over time. So it increases in the year that a, a tribe opens or expands a casino. Um, and the denominator is stable. So we're just using the midpoint of the population between 2000 and 2010. And so this makes it such that the only thing that is causing variation here is like uh, a tribe getting more slots per capita, or more slots really. Questions about that one? Yes. I had a question about um, the location differences. Did you see that there were any differences between urban and rural location? Well, so yes. I mean, I guess you mean between likelihood of opening up a casino if you're urban versus rural. Yes, if you're, if you're more urban or like hairy urban, um, definitely you're more likely to open a casino. But the nice thing about the state of California is that there are some rural areas with um, profitable casinos. So the tribes are spread out and some of, some of them are um, rural with casinos and some are rural without casinos. So we do have like a nice mixture. Um, it's not all urban who have casinos and all rural that don't. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, so then in our first paper, we're looking at our economic resources from Native American um, casinos associated with, um, or do they impact, if I want to use causal language, which I sort of feel prone to do, um, <laughs> childhood BMI and overweight prevalence. Um, again, I've told you about the health the source of the health data, it's coming from those annual fitness tests for fifth, seventh, and ninth graders. Um, another important thing about California is that um, a lot of the tribes are small, and so um, only a couple tribes have um, tribal high schools. It, so for the rest of the tribes, um, most likely kids are attending public or charter schools um, or private schools, but uh, most likely public or charter. There aren't, um, tribal high schools are not very prevalent in, um, or tribal middle schools um, are not prevalent in California. We're looking at child BMIZ score and child uh, uh, overweight and obesity prevalence um, together. We're using data from the uh, US Census and the American Community Survey for both the population numbers and 
you'll see we look at economic indicators um, in the next slide, I think. And then for the source of casinos, um, we had to build this ourselves looking at doing document reviews. So we looked at all the treaties between every state or every uh, tribe in California and the state of California, and that gave us some information about who had a casino in 1999 and how many slots did they have. And then we used LexisNexis and searched for uh, newspaper articles about openings and expansion to figure out when tribes expanded their casinos. We also use gambling websites, which tell you how many slots um, each of the uh, casinos have. Um, so we built this ourselves. Um, okay, and then here's a picture of uh, the tribes throughout the state of California. Um, so you can see they're spread throughout the, the state. The, the red dots are, are tribes and there are some, you know, that are near the big um, urban centers like down here is San Diego and Riverside. Um, Riverside has really successful um, or profitable casinos. Um, these would be more rural, but there still are some with casinos. And then up here in the Bay Area, there are also some that are very close to urban centers. Um, so we end up with 117 different school districts um, that encompass tribal lands. Uh, of these, 57 saw the opening or expansion of a casino, 24 had a pre-existing casino that didn't expand, and 36 never had a casino. Um, in terms of our study demographics um, and uh, descriptive stuff, um, we end up with 20, roughly 23,000 observations um, in our uh, time period, which I forgot to say is between 2001 and 2012, which was the most recent year we could get the data from the California Department of Education. Um, so these are sometimes the same kids over time and sometimes not. And we're on, except for four years of data, we're unable to link the same children over time. Um, <clears throat> the average age is 13 years old. The prevalence of overweight and obesity is 48%. Um, and the change in slots per capita over our time period for people who opened a casino was 13. So the average uh, slots gained is 13 slots per capita. Um, median household income is $30,000 a year. 42% um, of the population is living in poverty. 80% is employed. And um, the average size of the tribal population on tribal lands is 70 people. Um, this is our statistical model. I won't go through it in much detail, um, but this is just to say the first thing we do is see whether our slots per capita is associated with um, those economic indicators. And here we're using um, fixed effects models. This is where we um, try to layer some uh, methods that are good at controlling for unobserved confounding um, on top of this study design. And so what fixed effects models do is they compare each um, community to itself over time. So those um, aspects like rurality, uh, food environment, if it is mostly stable, um, kind of culture, those things are controlled for because we are doing, um, we're comparing communities to themselves over time, basically doing like a differencing um, model. Um, and then we're looking at average changes for communities that open a casino compared to communities that don't. So we found that our slots per capita opening or expanding a casino was associated with um, improvements in per capita income, um, marginally statistically significant improvements in median household income, and importantly, decreases in the percent of the population living in poverty. This is important because you could see movement in per capita income, but it could mean that only um, those at the upper end of the income spectrum are benefiting. But the fact that we see this decrease in the percent of, popu of the population in poverty, it makes sense because we know that most tribes are distributing those per capita payments in a, in a fairly equal fashion. But we do see this you know, moving a little bit um, here in terms of the percent living in poverty, meaning that it's reaching the, the intervention is reaching um, folks at the lower end of the income spectrum as well. Then we move into our models for um, looking at the impact of these casinos on BMI. Um, same setup where we're comparing school districts to themselves over time. It controls for uh, time invariant unmeasured confounding. Um, and here we find that increasing slots per capita, which we think is a proxy for economic resources, is associated with a decrease in child BMI Z score and a decrease in the probability of being overweight or obese. Um, and we tried to put this in perspective by looking at, you know, what, what do these numbers that look fairly small mean when we look at 
you know, the average change in slots per capita. So at 13 slots per capita, this would be an impact of two and a half percentage point uh, decline in overweight and obesity. Um, I think that's a pretty good impact. Um, it's very hard to come up with anything that moves overweight and obesity. Um, and we compared this to the Shape Up Somerville study, which was a community-wide intervention directly targeted at overweight and obesity. And they find in their study that after two years of the intervention, um, they find a three percentage point decrease in overweight and obesity among girls and four percentage point decrease in overweight and obesity among boys. So I think what we're seeing is you know, an intervention that is not at all targeted at weight but having a, a health impact, a weight impact um, at what I think is like a pretty reasonable level. If it were bigger than this, I think it'd be maybe hard to believe. Um, okay, so then we take that same method and we look at large for gestational age, which we're looking at, um, at sort of risk, uh, a risk indicator of overweight and obesity from a different life stage. Um, here we're using those uh, birth records and we use maternal uh, zip code as the geographic linkage instead of school district in this study. Um, and we end up with 124 different zip codes. This is different because we have that different geography, 76 of which open or expand a casino. We have more opening or expanding a casino because we're able to look at this data further back in time. So we get to start in 1987, which predates one big wave of casino expansion in California. Um, we have roughly, we have 21,000 uh, births that to either Native American mothers or fathers um, in the sample over this time period. We use our same slots per capita. We use the lagged value, so the year, we take the value in the year that the woman was pregnant um, rather than the year that the birth happened, so the year before the pregnancy. Because um, we want to capture, we think that uh, large for gestational age is you know, somewhat determined by what goes on during gestation. And we wanted to capture the resources during that period. And here, um, we find that Increased slots per capita is actually associated with a small decrease in the percent of the population born large for gestational age. So back then we have these two different data sets, two different life stages. This is another way that I think you can like triangulate results from a natural experiment where you really don't have control over that exposure and you're just being opportunistic. Um, but I think the fact that we see this in the same direction for both of the um, different data sources um, sort of bolsters the result from each. Um, okay, and then I'm going to quickly, quickly tell you about the qualitative study. Okay, um, so we, we did 36 semi-structured interviews with tribal leaders and tribal members, um, wondering what they thought of casinos and whether they would, um, whether they would um, think of any pathways by which casinos might impact their children's weight-related health or their community's weight-related health. Um, and again, participants did describe both positive and negative aspects of casinos. So, um, so just to acknowledge that the casinos were not described as like a wonderful positive thing in all, in all ways. Um, in turn, but most participants did say that casinos did improve the individual and the tribal um, financial stability. Um, and people did um, come up with ways that they thought the casinos and the money from casinos had impacted the um, BMI or the weight related health of children in their community or at least physical activity and eating if not weight. Um, so these are some quotes, you probably can't see these um, and I'm just gonna pick out a couple. I think they're all really interesting, um, but one thing that came up a lot was sports and many times, I don't know about you, but when I work in this field and talk about money and income, many people say to me like, well, physical, there's so many things about physical activity that are free, like everybody can do that. I'm like, not really, like physical activity has a cost. And a lot of people ended up saying that in our sample. So like this first quote says, a lot of our kids will participate in football season. They'll actually participate on those types of teams where maybe before they weren't able to because their parents couldn't afford to pay. The second quote, a quote talks about um, the, how the casino provides the sports, then there's the transportation, there's the equipment, there's the coaching, all that stuff that goes along the recreation, so it provides all of that. Another um, tribal member describes that their um, tribe built a fitness center with money from the casino. Um, this quote describes, <laughs> this is kind of funny, she says, I don't know how that affects body mass index, which like when I read that I was like, oh, you totally did not make a good question. Um, she, <laughs> 
But, um, but I know I've been very fortunate to buy my children as much organic food as I can. And then this last one I really like because I think it just gets at like the stress of life um, and how this might impact our health in general and maybe weight. And she says, um, oh, my health, yeah, it, meaning the casino, does play a role in health because I'm able to provide, I'm able to take my kids places and show them things, pay for outings and whatnot. I mean, we're able to buy that buy better food. So um, that just gives you a flavor of like the, the qualitative um, uh, data that came out of this study. Um, and then we use that to develop this survey of community resources. So we went through all the responses and we looked at every um, resource that people mentioned and then developed a survey to try to capture those resources plus other ones that we thought were there and might be related. Um, so we um, asked about resources in five domains, community infrastructure, health care and health education programs, recreation infrastructure, recreation programs, and social determinants of health, which are things like scholarships for um, college and housing, and not scholarships, but housing. Um, we were able to get responses from 81 unique tribes, which is a 79% response rate. Um, 40 had casinos and 40 did not. Um, we asked for the survey to be completed by a tribal administrator or a tribal community member that had knowledge of the community resources and their history when they came into the community. Um, so this is just a look, um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna mention all of the things that are included in each of these domains, but we did create a total score for the, for the community resources. Um, we weighted each of these domains equally by assigning five point, five, a possible five points to each of them um, for 25 points total. And then our first pass at this data, we looked at whether places that owned a casino um, scored higher on the community resources score. And that's this first box here. So you can see that um, having a casino is associated with a five point higher total resource score. And of the different components, the five different components, um, the ones that are statistically significantly different are community infrastructure, uh, social determinants of health, and recreation infrastructure. Um, so then, in the final preliminary analysis of this paper, we want to put that total community, uh, the total community resource score into a mediation analysis to see whether these community resources mediate that association between uh, casinos and BMI. Um, and in this case, we um, made the community resources time varying since we had asked when they came into the community. So we link it up with our like longitudinal community level data set. Um, and these, this is where we get to the preliminary stuff. Um, so first, we, um, because we have responses from only 80 tribes, our sample differed a little bit. Um, so we wanted to test like, okay, now we have 16,000 instead of 23,000 observations. Do we still see this relationship between uh, casino slot per capita and BMIZ? And we do see the negative relationship here. Um, then we um, regress uh, BMIZ on casino slots while controlling for those community resources. And you see that the negative relationship is a little bit attenuated and that's what you would expect if you're putting a mediator in a model. Um, the coefficient on community resources just for interest sake is also negative, meaning a higher community resource score is associated with a lower average BMIZ. Um, and then we regress the community resources on casino slots, and we see that uh, slots per capita is associated with that higher community resource score. So this is all consistent. And then finally, we use a difference method to calculate the proportion of the effect of casinos on BMI that is mediated through um, community resources or the community resources that we measured. And we find that about 13% of that uh, association is mediated through community resources. And again, we think that this, you know, my hypothesis is that this is happening at the community level, but also that that individual income is, you know, makes up some of what's left over from that 13%. So I'm probably out of time. This is just a quick summary. Um, and, but I think you're all with me. Um, so I'll just say there's definitely limitations here and we can talk more about these in the uh, question and answer. We, you know, don't have individual family income, which is why we can't test it as a mediator. We don't have tribal affiliation and instead we rely on geography as a proxy for whether we think um, kids are uh, getting benefits from the casino. Um, the data, the mediation analysis is preliminary. So um, as we, you know, look at that a bit longer and do more things to it, I'm not sure it will stay. Um, 
but um, then the data are administrative data. They're collected routinely. They're gonna have more measurement error than um, like a data collected on a research protocol. Uh, we don't think that error would be systematically different for casino versus non, um, but just to acknowledge that. Um, and then it's really unclear about the generalizability, um, even to Native Americans and other states, because California does have some really big casinos, um, some really profitable casinos, and it's not clear that we'd see the same type of thing like in the in the Midwest, say. Um, also, culture is different. Um, I, there was a similar study in North Carolina that found that among the poorest population for a Native American tribe that received the casino, that their obesity outcomes actually got worse. But that study was done a long time ago in the mid 90s, like before we had this sort of um, common knowledge about overweight and obesity and its um, sort of contributors. And I think the context is different um, in California versus the rest of the country. So these things might be different. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Open it up for questions. Um, did you experience any barriers when getting data or um, working with tribal members on any of the stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, yes, and you know, rightly so. I think that the history um, between Native Americans and researchers is um, fraught with kind of researchers taking advantage of Native American populations. Um, and you know, that is one of the reasons why up front I partnered with the California Rural Indian Board and the Tribal Health uh, Epi Center. And I basically asked them, like, is this an okay idea? Can I do this? Um, and many of the people that work in those two places are Native American and oftentimes from California. Um, and then they have uh, really tight connections or at least pretty good connections to other tribes in the states, particularly in Northern California. Um, that said, yes, I mean, um, casinos are a really contentious topic. So sort of at, by the end of this study, the California Indian Board had turned over in leadership and the new leader was actually just personally against casinos and he didn't really want to be in, like, he didn't want to have his name or his agency's name like involved in the study anymore. Um, and so there's just a lot of individual things like that. Getting responses, I, I mean, the only reason we got responses from 80% of the tribes was because we had an amazing data collector. We, you know, started out with a mailed survey and then we sort of upped the, the when we, for people we didn't get with the mailed survey or the email survey, we went out in person um, and, you know, tried to get data that way. But, you know, many tribes said like, I can't answer this. I need to take this to my council before I can answer. Um, and some of them took it to the council and came back and answered, and some of them just never responded. So yes, it's, it's you know, I, I think I, the reason also, like I feel like there's a lot more that could be done here looking at different health outcomes, but I um, don't want to do it until I have a new partner um, that, you know, is, it feels supportive of the work and um, can be, you know, a, a clear kind of thought partner in it um, too. I'm not really sure how to phrase this one, but I'm curious about some of the naturalistic studies. Obviously, they're not as easily replicated, so how does that kind of fit into building needs for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, one, I do think that um, that others could look for data to try to do this in different places. Um, and that's one way to replicate um, and figure out. I mean, I, I also really believe in, you know, heterogeneity of effects. Like the, the North Carolina study, I think they could do that study again now and see if those effects are still there for kind of current um, age kids. Um, and the other thing is to like, look at the body of literature about these income boosts taking into account like context and population. Um, but there are other studies, you know, about that earn, earned in income tax credit. Um, and I think we can look at sort of the totality of does uh, increased economic resources seem to have an impact on weight related health in that way, but it is hard to replicate these for sure. Um, what would you say is the next 
steps for you know research like this or um, like taking your research down? Yeah. Um, so I have because of um, I mean I think the next steps for this. That's such a good, that's a really good question. I don't know. I do think there are a lot of different health outcomes that could be looked at in the same way. And one that I have a colleague who's um, an expert in uh, violence and suicide, and suicide is a really important um, issue in Native communities. Um, and the numbers are small, so you kind of need like a huge sample to detect anything. But I do think that suicide um, and violence could be another good outcome to look at. And again, like I, um, I'm just sort of need to build partners that are interested in that and like part of the native community in order to sort of feel good about going in that direction. Um, but then, you know, I'm interested in economic resources. I'm interested in these structural things. So like I'm thinking about other, other natural experiments um, and just waiting till a grant gets funded <laughs> um, for my other ideas on, on those. But I do think there's things, you know, like the tax policy, like um, Medicaid expansion is a huge policy that affects people's, um, people's financial stability or financial um, aspects. So things like that are what's on my mind of trying to get data that I could link up and look at other um, structural stuff. Have you thought of, or have you already done, um, like a dissemination plans to that the community that you're serving to the Native American population and, and if you have or if you're planning on it, what does that look like? Yeah, so we, um, in the midst of this study, when we still had the California Rural Indian Health Board and California Tribal Rec uh, Epicenter on board, we went to um, a couple Native conferences and uh, presented posters um, at those conferences. Um, we also did a, uh, a, like we produced data um, at the request of tribes in California that came to the California Rural Epicenter. So they were just interested in prevalence um, by tribal area in overweight and obesity. And so we took that request and like produced that data for them. Um, so yeah, I, I- Do you find that the, that it resonates with the population? Like they see the data and they say, oh wow, like does it resonate with them in terms of health improves? at least based on the data? Um, it resonated in the qualitative interviews. At the um, presentation back to communities at these conferences, um, two, both of the conferences I think were hosted by IHS um, and uh, the Indian Health Service. And um, it was the reaction for people coming by the poster was, was pretty mixed, like some surprised and some not surprised. Um, and, and pretty skeptical, like, how did you get, you know, like, where's the data coming from? Like, a, a, like definitely a bit of like, how do we know this? Um, it's not individual data, like what can we say about it? But definitely, I mean, the qualitative interviews, talking to people um, in these tribes and tribal leaders, um, these weight-related health findings definitely resonated. Um, I would say 75% of those interviews um, people would often also say something like, well, the casino came and, um, and then fast food came, and so our like, food environment has changed. I have one more happy comment, I have a question, but um, this is like, this study is blowing my mind. It's awesome. And it, there's so much that you're looking at. I'm just curious about, in your opinion, what was the most critical support that you have throughout the process? Yeah, I mean, maybe going back to the, um, to the, I guess two things, like the California Rural Epi Board, like the or, uh, Rural Indian Health Board and the Tribal Epi Center, like without them, this would not have been possible at all. Um, so certainly that is like a necessary component um, and a necessary support structure, I think. Although I, I probably could have just gotten the data and done my own thing with the administrative data, like it's out there, I just requested it, I just did it, but to feel like it meant something um, and like it was okay with the population and like we could vet it and go through the IRB um, that required the California Epi Center. And then I had an awesome mentor. Um, so definitely like props to good mentors. Um, and somebody who just like really pushed me to do like all of the extra analysis with a, with a, 
and a natural experiment, I feel like the first result you get, like you have to just like keep interrogating it and trying to prove that it's wrong in order to feel like it is really the, you know, the truth that you're after. So, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you.